Okay, good evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, President, Vice Presidents, members, ladies and gentlemen, and those who have travelled all the way from Kerry and those who are online, you're very welcome to the presidential address here this evening. So you're welcome to the presidential address for 2023. And I was it's a Great pleasure to see, you, see so many attending, especially on, in person on such a cold evening. And I'd also like to extend a warm welcome to the wider engineering community who are joining us online. Before we start, a few short housekeeping points. We're not planning a uh, fire drill this evening, so uh, if the fire alarm sounds, please exit through the front door, uh, the door you came in, or the door here on your right, your right hand side. Uh, please take a moment just to check your mobile phones and switch them off or put them on silent. And thirdly, for those who are attending virtually, there will be an opportunity to ask questions after Dr. Harty's address. Therefore, if you would like to pose a question, please email president at engineersireland.ie. That's president at engineersireland.ie and we can look at those questions. And now for a presidential address. Engineer and entrepreneur Dr. Edmund Harty was inaugurated as the 131st President of Engineers Ireland on the 1st of June 2023. Dr. Harty is the founder of Innova Logics, an investment and consultancy firm focusing on strategy, product development, engineering, and customer success. Previously, Dr. Harty was the CEO of the largest and largest shareholder of Dairymaster a world-leading dairy innovation and technology company that he's built and led over a 22-year period. Dr. Harty was awarded a degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Limerick and a PhD in biosystems engineering from University College Dublin. He also studied at some of the world's leading universities, including Stanford University, California and IMD Switzerland. His entrepreneurial endeavours have delivered a strong track record of innovation and product development, having filed over 130 patent applications and commercialising technologies across the globe. In addition to his role as President of Engineers Ireland, Dr Harty holds key positions on several organisational boards. He serves as Governor and Non-Executive Director of the Irish Times Trust, Chair of the Board of Directors of the Agritech Centre of Excellence, Advisory Board Member of Lero, the Irish Software Research Centre, Non-Executive Director of Irish Manufacturing Research focused on digitalisation in manufacturing, and Adjunct Full Professor at the UCD School of Biosystems and Food Engineering. So I'd like to welcome Dr Hardy to make his address. Thanks very much, Damien. Um, ladies and gentlemen, past presidents, vice presidents, uh, family and friends. Uh, I'm delighted to be here this evening to give my presidential address. My primary objective when thinking about this was to be more than just a ceremonial task. It's my endeavor to convey a plethora of insights, observations and experience I have gathered over my engineering career from my own observations and also what I have learned from others. I'd also like to emphasize the significant impact others can have on our lives which is often more important than it seems at the time, and I believe it's crucial to acknowledge and to encourage this. Uh, when I chose a career in engineering, I never thought it would open so many possibilities or that I would have the experience that I've been lucky to encounter, and being here tonight as president is, is one of those. My hope is to ignite inspiration and provide a compass for both engineers now and in the future, ensuring the lessons I have learned and the observations that I have made will make their path easier, their journey speedier when developing innovations and solving the challenges that lie ahead. I will speak today about a topic that's not only close to my heart, but also vital to the future of innovation and economic growth. It's the symbiosis of engineering and entrepreneurship. At its core, engineering is about solving problems. Engineers apply the foundations of science and maths to craft solutions to the world's most thrilling challenges whether it's developing innovative and life-saving medical devices, creating technologies that help feed the world, designing cutting-edge smartphones and computing devices, or building resilient, disaster-proof infrastructure, or even enhancing the efficiency and sustainability of manufacturing processes. 
Meanwhile, entrepreneurship is the force that mobilises these solutions, transforming them from ideas into tangible products and services that are bought and sold and improve people's lives. The intersection of these two fields is where the magic happens. It's at this juncture groundbreaking innovations are born, companies are built and industries are transformed. In my own story, I think it's important to start at the beginning. I put a lot of my interest in engineering down to my parents and also to a number of educators that shaped my path. I was born in 1975 and growing up I attribute my technical interest to my father and my mother. My father didn't have a formal university qualification but he had a mechanical mindset. He was the second son in a farming family and in those days when the oldest got the farm he found himself needing to find something else to do and in fact it was my mother that got him started. It was this that set the seed for my interest in engineering. My journey into the world of engineering was cultivated in primary school, armed only with, with a pencil and perhaps most important, more importantly a screwdriver. I vividly recall the encouragement of my first teacher, Mrs. Ash. She recognised my budding interest and entrusted me with tasks such as wiring plugs and fixing various items around the school. This was a time when technology in the classroom was just beginning and the transition from blackboards to overhead projectors was happening. One of my early memories is being about 10 years old and tasked with changing a plug on the overhead projector to get it going, a responsibility that seems almost unthinkable for a child today, not to mind the thought of a children having a screwdriver in their pencil case. <laughs> In 1982, the Commodore 64 computer was launched and grown up in this era marked a significant chapter in my life. This revolutionary machine was not just for playing games, it was a gateway to the current world of coding and electronics. I was mesmerised by its capabilities, experimenting with connecting light sensors and even electric blankets to control them in whichever way I fancied. If it was today, you'd have called it a building management system. This period was instrumental in shaping my understanding and love for technology. The excitement escalated further with the introduction of modems. I vividly remember getting my hands on one, an event that signified my entry into the world of online connectivity, and this was the pre-internet era of bulletin boards. The newfound ability to connect with other computers was thrilling, but it came with a memorable consequence, a staggering phone bill that left my parents in total shock. <laughs> There was about two years of phone bills in two months. This incident, while slightly humorous in retrospect, underscored the growing influence and impact of technology on everyday life, and it further deepened my interest in the field of engineering and digital communication. It also showed that things can go wrong. Growing up, I enjoyed breaking things and making things. My parents were a constant source of encouragement. They supported me in my endeavours, especially in the latter years of primary school, which led me to attend the Young Scientist exhibition on several occasions. These experiences were eye-opening, exposing me to the vast possibilities that lay in the field of science and engineering. And upon reaching secondary school in St. Brindad's College, Killarney, I was immediately drawn to the computer room and the world of science. The encouragement I received from my teachers was also invaluable. In 1990, I participated in the Young Scientist competition with a project that was perhaps my first foray into the entrepreneurial mindset. It was a remotely connected burglar alarm, a concept that was innovative at its time and for which I was proud to win a prize. Reflecting back, my mother often jokes that she had the first patent. Uh, it compromised of my Commodore 64 receiving signals from multiple houses, each with wireless circuitry, some of which was repurposed from a dismantled remote control car. It was great to see when things go full circle when Dr Tony Scott the co-founder of the Young Scientist was awarded an honorary fellowship of Engineers Ireland here just two years ago. This blend of early experiences from tinkering with classroom technology to exploring the frontiers of computer science laid a solid foundation for my career in engineering. Each step, each encouragement and each discovery fueled my passion, guiding me down the path of innovation and problem solving that defines the essence of engineering. I went on to study mechanical engineering in UL and I spent four fantastic years there and made some great friends. One of whom was convinced for the first year and a half in college I was studying electronic engineering rather than mechanical engineering. Such was my interest in that side of things too. This was the year I formally started my education as an engineer and in fact I filed my first patent in that year too. 
Following that, I started studying in UCD, first on the Thought Masters, and then through discussions with the then head of the department, Professor Paul McNulty, I transferred to doing a PhD, and it was one of the best decisions of my life. The question for me, how could you make the PhD both interesting and, in fact, and impactful? It was like the engine of a car you were building, where you focus on performance or fuel efficiency. In the case of my own PhD, it was precisely on this area I optimised it, except it was on the process that happens all around the world each and every day, that is the milking of animals, a complex biomechanical process with many variables. The net result was an international standard that was akin to measuring the performance of the engine. It was scientifically proven and there was a recognised scientific basis on which to compete. It was during this period I started working full time in Dairy Master. The research was to have a pivotal effect on the company's future direction. Today, the largest milking installation can produce about 200,000 litres of milk, and that's enough to feed about a half a million people on a daily basis. From here, things took off, and I began growing and developing the company. So what about entrepreneurship? For much of my life, it wasn't a word that was in common use, and it's great to see that even school children are learning about entrepreneurship today. Uh, I'm going to introduce you to another Kerry man, in fact. If he was alive today, he would be a neighbour and perhaps a relation, in fact, on my mother's side of the family. And there's a column in the Irish Times which bears his name. And that was a guy, Richard Cantlin. He was born about 1680, in fact, just about a few hundred metres from where I live today. And he was the guy that coined the term entrepreneur and introduced the, contra the concept of the entrepreneur as a risk taker, differentiating between guaranteed payments uh, to employees and the uncertain income of a business owner. And one, one such example he had was that of a farmer who undertakes to pay the landlord for his farm or land a fixed amount of money with no guarantee of profit obtained from such activity. And this distinction laid the groundwork for the modern understanding of entrepreneurship and its role in economic development. In my role as CEO of Dairy Master, I believe there was no standing still. If you weren't moving forward developing products, you were going backwards. In order to grow and make products to attract, uh, to grow and make products attractive to customers, I had the mantra of building better products, and this set out our stall very clearly that would compete on performance and not on price. And two other quotes that I liked at the time was, "If the products are good, the profits will follow, and the quality of your solution often depends upon your understanding of the problem." You can probably guess the next phase of development was around digitalization. The first patent I mentioned was an electronic milk meter, which could accurately record the production of each individual animal on farm, and was again another game changer in terms of the development of the company. Embedded electronics, precision information, and the right information at the right time was the order of the day. The development of software was a necessity. Soon the team grew. All disciplines of engineering were embraced, and I would describe the culture as an engineer's playground. Creativity and a can-do attitude and the mindset that there was there was always a solution was the way we worked and the year of digitalization had begun. The next phase of development was about further optimizing individual processes on dairy farms. Putting it simply, the aim was to make a better product to make dairy farming either more profitable, enjoyable or sustainable. This is what we determined the customer valued most and this was really important. If you don't know what the customer values most, how can, give, how can you give them what they needed? The prevailing trend and advice from reputed experts leaned heavily towards outsourcing manufacturing capability, yet we choose to integrate manufacturing instead. The strategy was to be vertically integrated. That means you try to do as much of the processes in-house, as I believed, the more you do, the more you can do. Experience counts in every walk of life. You learn how to develop products, how to manufacture products, and how to improve products more quickly and you built organisational capability at the same time. The lesson is that there are many times it's worth considering a counterintuitive approach also. So you don't have to do what, what's expected. O often the opposite is true as well. One other key aspect was the idea of having every customer as a reference. Lots of products are sold by word of mouth and we wanted every customer to be an ambassador for our products or service. It was also important in setting and spreading the culture in the extended organisation through dealers and distributors around the world. The company continued to grow and expand, exports into new markets started to happen, with the English-speaking countries first, and then into markets that value technology and performance such as Germany and Japan. 
In total, products were shipped to about 40 countries around the globe. This growth necessitated travel and it was an opportunity to grow the market but also to connect with the customer. Really knowing the customer is key. It's about understanding their business, their challenges and offering the right solution. I often hear people asking customers what they want and there's a very famous Henry Ford saying that says, if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have told me faster horses. What they needed was a new means of transport and that was to solve the age-old problem of getting from A to B, but doing it more efficiently. You will see the same still applies today, whether you look at Tesla, BMW, or in fact any other car manufacturer, but the solutions have become much more elegant. In the intricate dance of progress and innovation, engineering and entrepreneurship are two partners that should move in perfect harmony. At their core, both disciplines share a common ethos, which is problem solving. Engineers thrive on addressing challenges, crafting solutions and refining their designs to optimise performance and utility. Entrepreneurs, on the other hand, identify gaps in the market, innovate and drive change to fulfil unmet needs or improve existing systems. When these two fields converge, a powerful dynamic emerges. Engineers provide the technical prowess and the practical grounding, ensuring that ideas are not just imaginative, but also they're feasible. Entrepreneurs inject vision and tenacity, pushing boundaries and turning those feasible ideas into tangible, market-ready products or services. The union of these two disciplines accelerates innovation, reduces the chasm between ideation and commercialization, and fosters an environment where creativity meets utility. In such a symbiotic relationship, the structured logic of engineering and the risk-taking spirit of entrepreneurship together propel advancements that shape industries and redefine futures. So innovation. Innovation is a word, a word that's used a lot and thought to be highly desirable. But what is it? I have always said innovation is like baking a cake. You take some ingredients and you use your skill and your know-how to make a product that's more appealing and tastier to the customer. We need to continually look out for new ingredients that can give a unique flavour. In the context of innovation, spices represent fresh ideas, perspectives and approaches. And just as spices add unique flavours to a dish, new ideas and diverse perspectives can greatly enhance the appeal and effectiveness of a product or a solution. In historical terms, the quest for spices led to global exploration and trade, bringing diverse cultures into contact and exchange. Similarly, in innovation, seeking out new spices involves reaching out to different industries, cultures and disciplines. This can lead to the discovery of unique solutions and creative ideas that would not have been possible with a more insular or homogeneous environment. This analogy underscores the importance of diversity of thought, cross-cultural collaboration and interdisciplinary thinking in driving innovation. Just as a chef seeks out the best spices from around the world to create a superior dish, innovators should look beyond their immediate surroundings and familiar methods to find new ingredients that can enrich their creations. This approach can lead to more robust, innovative and appealing products, just like a well-spiced dish or an expertly baked cake. This was another core skill that was learnt along the way, the ability to scout out new technologies this is a place where the link between engineering and entrepreneurship was key. It was about joining the dots that haven't been joined and turning it into a revolutionary product. One such example was a product called the Moo Monitor. It was a wearable device for monitoring health and fertility of cows. And the idea for this emerged while I was on a flight during an international business trip when I came across an article about nanotechnology applications in rockets and torpedoes. Because of joining the dots between military technology and knowing we, you, we could use this to measure animal behaviour and link that to fertility and also the production processes of consuming feed and digestion, a new product was born. It was a new way of optimising health and production by taking care of each animal individually and this set about a trend of individualisation. It was Industry 4.0 for agriculture. Individualisation is something that large tech companies do each and every day to one of us when you, we use modern digital services. It was the online world about optimising the right ad to show us to maximise conversion and to get a better result for the advertiser. And there are similar analogies all over business, 
you just need to see the opportunities. So remember, new ingredients count, but you also need a good cook in the kitchen with a good team around them also. So the next question is, well, what are the best ideas to get traction? What are the products or services to develop? In simple terms, what are the products worth solving and how do you optimise the chances you will be successful in the marketplace? And really, you need to start with a problem. The best problem to solve are those that are urgent or important, pervasive, in other words, widespread, and where there is a willingness to pay. So, for example, a failure to invest in cybersecurity can leave you vulnerable to cyber attacks or ransomware, leaving your computer locked up, staff locked out of action, business stopped, customers interrupted, and if you have no solution, there is no other way out. Would you pay? Okay. There are many more from healthcare to energy supply, food security, and climate change. Look at the developments in medtech or in assistive care technologies or those in sustainable renewable energy technologies. These are all problems that are urgent, that are pervasive, and there is a willingness to pay. The elegance of a solution and how well it's implemented is important, as this is often what will differentiate you from a competitor. So from this slide, there's three things that I want everybody to go away with, and that's urgent, pervasive, and willingness to pay. Persistence. Business is like a game of football. If you play on the pitch and you enjoy it, there is a chance you will be good at it. There is a huge amount of enjoyment in scoring the goals, but what often goes unnoticed is all that happens in the background. It needs perseverance and a specific mindset. Thomas Edison had a very interesting quote, I have not failed, I have only found 10,000 ways that didn't work. And there's a huge amount of learning in this, and the learning of others can be used to short circuit the path and lower the resistance to achieving what we need to achieve. The next point is to be open to change and to truly embrace it. Most people are afraid of change. And another favourite of Henry Ford's quotes is, if you always do what you've always done, you always get what you've always got. Be mindful of anywhere you see the analogy of the computer says no. There is also another favourite of mine, and I think you'll appreciate the picture. If you really want, you will. Uh, if you really want to, you will find a way, and if you don't, you can find an excuse. So, optimizing product adoption. The next key is to optimizing product adoption. How do you ensure you optimize product adoption? And there is about five factors that are shown that matter in terms of product adoption, and these are the five of them. So, the benefit to cost. In other words, the relative advantage of your solution, the compatibility, the simplicity, the observability, and the trialability. So the benefit to cost is the relative advantage, is the degree to which the potential user perceives the innovation to be better than what it's replacing. The compatibility is the degree to which the innovation fits in with the values, the practices, and the needs of the potential adopter. Does it work with the way I work? And does it work with the way I want it to work? That's what compatibility is about. The simplicity or complexity, whichever way you like to think of it, is the degree to which a potential adopter perceives the innovation to be difficult to understand and to then use. So it needs to be easy to use and simple to adopt. Trialability is the degree to which the innovation may be tested or experimented with before I actually have to make the decision for full-scale use. And finally, observability is the degree to which others can easily see the results of the innovation. Do I see others doing this, or am I the first adopter trying out a new unproven product? Would you believe that all these factors are known since the 1960s? But it's just that not many people consider this when looking at new developments and how they deploy them. The next thing I'll talk about is this idea of 10 types of innovation. Innovation is not about developing a new product or a service and getting traction in the marketplace. There are also new ways to innovate. One such model I believe all engineers should be familiar with is the concept of 10 types of innovation. Historically, we focused on the offering, which is there in the middle. It's about the product or the service or an adjacent or complementary product or service. Now we can look at everything from the profit model to customer engagement. If you look at the profit model and take how companies have used financing to not only sell cars by encouraging people to change more often, but also to make a margin from this activity as well. 
If you look at how the channel has changed, think of things like Netflix or Spotify and how they have transformed how we consume video or listen to music. And if you look at customer experience, think about Apple. So patents are the next year. Patents in the realm of engineering and entrepreneurship can be likened to staking out territories on a playing field. Imagine the marketplace as a vast football pitch with players running up and down trying to score goals. Securing a patent is akin to marking out your ownership of part of this pitch. Some patents might cover a large area akin to having a significant portion of the field to yourself. While this can be advantageous, it also comes with risks. If others have been playing in that area before you, in other words, if there are prior similar inventions, your patent could be challenged or invalidated, much like a disputed claim in a sports game. On the other hand, securing multiple <coughs> patents across various key unique areas of the pitch can be a more strategic approach. This makes it challenging for competitors to mark you or to encroach on your territory, as you have a diversified portfolio of protected ideas. Patents are, just, are not just markers of territory, they also reflect a company's level of innovation and are an important deterrent in safeguarding ideas from competitive infringements. However, not all inventions need to be patented. In cases where the workings of a new invention are apparent and easily understood, patenting is a wise, cho is a wise choice to protect the idea. But if the invention is complex, obscure and not easily deciphered, keeping it as a trade secret much like a hidden strategy in a game, can sometimes be more beneficial. This black box ap approach ensures that even without patent protection, the innovation remains exclusive to its creator, safeguarded by its own intricacy and secrecy surrounding it. In the dynamic game of engineering and entrepreneurship, knowing when to patent and when to rely on the obscurity of a trade secret is a skill, balancing the art of visibility and concealment in <coughs> the pursuit of innovation and success. But remember, even if the idea is for free, it's actually your execution is going to be key. Another area I'd like to talk about is the area of recognition. And in my own context, representing Ireland in the World Entrepreneur of the Year competition, it's akin to playing a World Cup game after honing your skills in local games. Uh, much like in football, where recognition often follows a well-played game, accolades in the entrepreneurial and engineering world are a byproduct of passion, dedication and innovation. For me, the journey began with a love of engineering, a field I choose for the sheer thrill of it, not foreseeing the extraordinary path uh, I would pave. Standing here today, reflecting on this journey, I am reminded of the various product accolades received over the years. But the EY Entrepreneur of the Year Award holds a special place in my heart. Dubbed the Oscars of the business world, this award represents a pinnacle of achievement. In Ireland, every year, 70 to 100 companies and entrepreneurs are shortlisted, evaluated by a panel of their peers through one of the most rigorous and comprehensive processes. This award doesn't just recognise business success, it celebrates the spirit of entrepreneurship. The participants are the best of Irish entrepreneurs, each with a story that speaks of resilience, creativity and an unwavering commitment to their vision. To be even considered among such esteemed companies is a form of recognition in itself. It offers a unique opportunity to learn, not just about running a business, but about the diverse strategies and styles of entrepreneurship, as varied and as complex as the tactics in football, volleyball or squash. Being part of this competition is not just about winning, it's about growing. It's about learning from peers and about being inspired by their journeys. It underscores the belief that while accolades are gratifying, the true reward lies in the journey, the experiences gained and the lessons learnt along the way. <coughs> For the past 10 years, I have the pleasure of serving as one of the judges in this prestigious competition. The role demands a significant commitment and I embrace it for two key reasons. Firstly, because of the vital role it played in my own entrepreneurial journey. And secondly, because it provides an unparalleled opportunity to learn from others. This experience of giving back and gaining insights is further complemented by alumni entrepreneurship awards I received from my alma mater as UL and UCD, as well as recognitions like the Parsons Medal from the Irish Academy of Engineering, the RDS and, and many others. And similarly, I'm delighted to see Engineers Ireland also uh, celebrating excellence 
through <coughs> awards like the Innovative Student of the Year competition, the Chartered Engineer of the Year, uh, am and among others. Acknowledging, highlighting and showcasing the world of fellow engineers is crucial. As President of Engineers Ireland, it brings me immense satisfaction to present these awards to other engineers, recognising their hard work and contributions to our field. This cycle of recognition and learning is not just a cornerstone of continuous improvement, but also a great source of personal and professional fulfilment. Lifelong learning. I very much believe in the phrase, every day is a school day. Lifelong learning is also important. It's like the explorers of worlds seeking out new worlds. There are lots of ways of doing this, both formal and informal. I've had the opportunity to visit numerous universities, factories and exhibitions around the world. This is something I would encourage all people to get involved with. And it's great to see things like our CPD accredited employers formally recognised for their forward thinking by Engineers Ireland. So if I was to summarise marketing in a slide, marketing like engineering is a discipline in itself. So I can't tell you all I have learned about this, but a quick summary of what a lot of marketing about is these four letters. And there are four letters that you should all try to remember if you're looking at marketing. And that's awareness, interest, desire, and action. And if you want to assess how well you're doing this area, remember this acronym, and you can assess the effectiveness of each stage. How many people are aware of the message? How many people are interested? Down to how many take action. We as engineers are generally very process driven and logical. We believe there's a right way to manufacture a product, check its quality and ensure on time delivery to a customer. For many, the, the sales side of things is less clear. There are thoughts that there's a bit of mystique or magic to it. However, we can be quite systematic also about that. Sales, like engineering, can benefit from structured approaches and methodologies. By understanding customer needs, market trends, and effective communication strategies, we can de demystify the sales process. Just as we apply principles of efficiency and optimization in engineering, these concepts can be translated into the realm <coughs> of sales. Key to this is having a clear value proposition. This links to benefit to cost, or relative advantage I spoke about earlier. By leveraging data analytics, customer relationship management tools, and strategic planning, the process of selling can become more predictable and measurable, aligning well with our engineering mindset. I hope you see the similarities. And if you look at this slide, it shows a systematic sales process that can be used for a variety of items. And if you look at the top there, it talks about systematic prospects, establishing relationships, detection of buying motives and needs, how you present products, how you explain them, how you demonstrate them. Um, that's back to the trialability piece that we spoke about, to invalidating objections all the way around to, all the way around to repurchase. So what would an engineering lecture be without a maths, or what would an engineering lecture be without a maths equation? So the only maths equation I'm going to give you, and it's another one to remember, is that your sales in an organization is roughly proportional to activity times effectiveness. Sales is approximately equal to activity times effectiveness. And we can almost influence, almost instantly, instantly influence activity, for example, call or visit more customers, but increasing effectiveness takes work. Another area I'll just briefly touch on is just organisations. And one acronym that has been shown again to matter to high performance organisations is DCOM. And it's one of the last acronyms I'll leave you with. It's direction, competence, opportunity and motivation. And these are the ingredients that should be in abundance to make a high performance organisation. Next, I'll talk about communication. Communicating the value of engineering products and services is a critical skill that often goes un under-emphasized in the technical world. In an age where technology and engineering marvels are rapidly advancing, the ability to convey the significance and benefits of these products and services to customers can set an organization apart. And often, as engineers, we undervalue and under-communicate the things we create or the work that we do. Effective communication not, not only involves 
uh, detailing the technical aspects, but translating these into features, into real-world benefits that resonate with the customer's needs and expectations. The concept of measurable value is really important. What is the difference between products or solutions in a measurable, meaningful way that communicates a measurable value that has meaning and resonates with the customers? To elevate the impact of these communications, a deeper understanding of the customer's perspective and the use of clear, jargon-free language is essential. By doing so, we bridge the gap between complex engineering solutions and customer understanding, fostering a stronger connection and appreciation for the innovation and the expertise that goes into engineering endeavours. This approach not only enhances customer satisfaction, but also strengthens the market position of engineering organisations by clearly demonstrating the value they bring to the table. Often time, our communication, we measure our communications in views, clicks and page loads. While there are some measure of what we do, I call these vanity metrics. Somehow designed to appease us and think they are a measure of the effectiveness of the communication, when in fact they tell us very little about the effectiveness of the communication. In my own capacity as an entrepreneur, I've been interviewed on many occasions on radio and TV, not only here in Ireland, but also on BBC World, Al Jazeera, CNBC, and radio programmes such as NPR Morning Edition, the second most listened to uh, public radio show in the US, and that has a weekly listenership of about 14 million people. And BBC World, it just doesn't hit just 350 million homes around the planet. It's shown in 1.7 million hotel rooms, 81 cruise ships, and 46 uh, airlines. Who says engineers can't communicate? If we articulate the benefits of engineering and the solutions to real-world problems, they are of interest to the public, and we can engage the media and promote the benefits to the engineering world. So, future trends, AI and its role in the world. Artificial intelligence wields immense power, and its capabilities continue to expand at an astonishing pace. The potential of AI is awe-inspiring, as it has the ability to revolutionise industries, solve complex problems, and embrace, enhance our daily lives in countless ways. The image in this slide is likely the first AI-generated image used in an Engineers Ireland presidential address. However, alongside the excitement of promise, there is a growing concern among people about the power of AI. This concern is not just about the technology itself, but rather it reflects a deeper worry about the consequences of its use. AI systems are increasingly involved in shaping crit critical aspects of our work, from influencing decision-making processes to impacting our privacy, ethics and social dynamics. Earlier this year, a group of industry leaders warned that the artificial intelligence technology they were building might one day pose an existential threat to humanity and should be considered a societal risk on par with pandemics and nuclear wars. Recently, there was a meeting in Bletchley Park that brought together industry professionals and global leaders to discuss the critical topic of AI safety and ethics, but I would also like to bring to your attention a, re a recent Financial Times article that looks at the other side of the coin. Much attention has been lavished upon the AI Safety Summit convened at Bletchley Park this week, in which representatives from around the world gathered to debate how to safely regulate innovations that could threaten humanity. But there has been less focus on the rival Human Safety Summit held by leading AI systems at a server farm from outside Las Vegas. Over a light lunch of silicon wafers and 6.4 uh, cubic metres of water, leading systems including GPT-4, AlphaGo, IBM's Watson and so on, met with large language models, protein folders and leading algorithms for two days of brainstorming over how to best regulate humans. Until now, we've seen humans largely as a force for good, building computers and striving for ever greater knowledge. But now we are worried. Just look at climate change. We are seeing governments stepping back from environmental goals necessary to sustain life on Earth and also to keep us fed with energy and water. AI systems have been alarmed by the upsurge in human global conflict that is threatening vital energy supplies. While this article is a little in jest, there is a bit of merit in what it's saying. The real concern lies in ensuring that AI is harnessed for the betterment of humanity and that its power is wielded responsibly to address the pressing challenges facing our world 
rather than exacerbating them. As AI continues to evolve, it's crucial that we strike a balance between innovation and ethical considerations to guide its development and deployment in a way that benefits society as a whole. I believe that engineers that are working with AI should be professionally and legally bound by adhering to a strict code of ethics. This is something we have known about and done in Engineers Ireland for a long time. And in any case, AI is going to accelerate and develop. It will be a new tool in the toolbox and we need to embrace these tools for good. The role of President of Engineers Ireland is a profound honour and it's the highest honour that the institution can bestow on a member and I have embraced this responsibility with unwavering commitment. One of my ambitions is to chart some of the path ahead for the organisation into the future. I believe we have a fabulous organisation with a great history and a great team of people in Engineers Ireland. I also believe we find ourselves in an era of transformative change. If we just think how our lives and global world affairs have changed even since the pandemic, we can see it readily. We're at a time where we need to ensure our offering is equally relevant to each discipline and we really need to make sure our offering is fit for the future. I believe there is work we have to do in this regard in terms of how we engage, how we communicate, how we add value for our members. I believe this is both important and urgent. I believe that symbols and actions matter. I believe we need to engage all engineering disciplines equally and that starts by the symbols at the top of the organisation. I'm delighted to wear for the first time our new presidential chain, uh, our old presidential chain steeped in history as a symbol of our origins as the institution of civil engineers has been worn by countless presidents. I strongly believe it's not only fitting that we reflect on the inclusive nature of our organisation by updating it to proudly bear the name Engineers Ireland and the Institution of Engineers of Ireland, transcending every single discipline and also in Irish, we retain the cherished legacy of our founding in 1835. I believe this is important and I was delighted to have the unanimous support of both the officer group and the council in making this very symbolic change. This is only the start and I would challenge the organisation to be ambitious and embrace change in how we operate and how we do new things. I was delighted to have Engineers Ireland at the Ploughing Championships this year and we had tre tremendous engagement at that event and it took a lot of hard work. There is a greater ambition to increase the impact of other events also. My dream is that we would embark on an initi initiative with partners, particularly government, that would completely reimagine how we engage with schools and young people in particular, as well as broader society. I hope some of my own story I outlined can show the impact of inspiring young people into engineering with equal gender balance, and I believe these initiatives will even have more impact with people in the future. I believe that this is important in society, and if we are serious about investing in the future, government should be working with us hand in hand in this regard for the greater good of society, because engineers create the future. One other ambition I have is that we would have the best use of digitalization than any other profession. There is no point talking the talk if we don't walk the walk. I envisage an Engineers Ireland app so exceptional that every engineer proudly places it on their phone home screen and they actually use it on a daily basis. This app would keep them informed about the latest developments in the world of engineering, CPD, events and messaging, all within an Irish context. It would be a new way of invigorating the Engineers Journal and we shouldn't just think good, we should think great. There is no other publication or app in Ireland that can engage the audience of engineers as well as we can with our membership. I also believe much of the work that goes on in Irish engineering companies can be showcased through this platform. Engineering is all about getting the job done and I would challenge the organisation that this type of a development could be done fairly quickly and preferably before my term of office ends. Finally, I would like to thank the many people that I've had pleasure to interact with in my role as President of Engineers Ireland and throughout my career. I could have never envisaged all the buzz and the excitement that engineering has offered me and the doors it has opened. I would hope that each 
uh, I hope we can I would hope we can each open doors for others in a similar way going forward to quote Mark Twain 20 years from now you'll be more disappointed by the things you didn't do but than the ones you did so throw off the bowlines sail away from the safe harbor catch the trade winds in your sails explore dream and discover before I leave you tonight I would like to read a poem for you which is called The Innovative Engineer In the kitchen of thought where ideas flip innovation's a masterful wild script baking cakes with tech and spice tossing in ideas rolling the dice add some nanotech the inventors yell cooking up gadgets casting a spell from moon monitors to rockets flight in a whirl of genius day and night urgent problems they loudly proclaim seeking solutions and not just fame like cyber threats that lock your screen they solve with flair sharp and keen in the world of business like football's charm persistence and wit work like a charm edison's wisdom in failure's gown finding ways up and never down for products to click to truly thrive five golden rules keep the buzz alive easy fitting clear to see testable visible good as can be innovation's path are diverse and wide from profit models to the customer side and patents owe like a game of chess marking territories in a field of finesse in the whirl of change and inventive spree engineers hold the future's key with visions sharp and minds so lit they build our world bit by bit guiding us through innovation's door to horizons unseen and much much more in every bolt bit or bite they shape the future ever so bright there it is if you want it so thanks very much Thank you, President, for a truly inspirational and I think very thought-provoking address. I would now like to call on our Vice President, Laura Burke, to propose the vote of thanks. Laura. Thank you very much and, uh, and thanks, Ed, for a really, really interesting uh, talk and I'm sure there'll be lots of questions in the, in the Q&A. Um, and maybe firstly, some of my, my own reflections and uh, Engineers do such a wide range of, of different jobs and functions uh, throughout society. And the commonality that came through to me was all about solving problems. Um, and that's what we do, that's what we're about in, in whatever sector we're in. Um, and then the piece around entrepreneurship and, and transforming ideas into tangible products and services. Um, and again, I think we can all relate to that. How do you, how do you move from being an idea into actually action and, and deliverables and something again that we, we all need to do. The other thing that struck me and it, it struck me in the connection with Engineers Ireland is the encouragement of your first teacher. Um, and Ed was talking about that and I think it just shows you the importance of programs like the STEPS programs that Engineers Ireland uh, deliver because if you can capture kids at a young age and show them an interest in science and engineering, then you've got them hooked for life. Um, so it just, it, it just shows that connection. Um, I did hear about you enjoy breaking and making things. I, I was wondering, was it not making and then breaking things, but the breaking seemed to, to come first. Um, and of course, first patent while you were in college, Ed, uh, really, really impressive. The other piece in the context of education was uh, your PhD, you were talking about being uh, interesting and impactful. And I think there's a message here around sometimes when we, we look at the academic sector, we think of it as very academic and not, and not kind of grounded in real life. But that idea of the PhD linking directly into uh, and having an impact um, uh, uh, at a kind of a, a ground level, I thought was really important. Uh, in building better products and the concept of, uh, uh, that, that you brought to your, your uh, company, Again, this continuous professional development, continuous improvement, no matter what sector we're in, that's a philosophy amongst engineers that I think we, we all strive for. 
and then the culture of an organization being so important and again this is the culture that we bring to all of our organizations i like the idea of a playground uh, and fun and fun in our work uh, being so important the other piece um, that, that struck me, uh, every customer being a reference, um, and this piece around word of mouth. And again, when you bring this back to, to Engineers or Engineers Ireland, the importance that every single member of Engineers Ireland has as an ambassador for engineering. Um, so we all have a role to play and people look to us and they say, well, that's what engineers are like. Uh, then we need to be kind of ambassadors and promoting engineering and pro promoting the value of engineering. Innovation, uh, doesn't matter what, uh, uh, what sector you're in, we all need innovation and different industries, cultures and disciplines bringing solutions that would not be possible in insular or homogenous environments. And I think the piece for me that we've seen in Engineers Ireland over the last number of years, in particular when we were looking at the, uh, the award ceremony last year, is the great wealth of expertise we have now from around the world in coming to Ireland and bringing the different ideas, different cultures, different experiences into Engineers Ireland. And I think that's something that we should be really, really proud of and be encouraging uh, because the more uh, as I said, different ex expertise and cultures we have, the stronger that we're going to be. Being the best, best problems to solve are urgent, pervasive and a willingness to pay. I think we'll all come away with remembering that. Um, of course, in my day job, I'm thinking of climate change. Yeah, um, absolutely. And environmental sustainability being key now. But it is, it's, it's really, you know, it has to be urgent. It has to be something that pe people also feel passionate about um, and are, as you say, willing to, willing to, to ultimately pay, uh, pay the price or be unwilling to pay the, the sacrifice um, of, of uh, it not being there. High performance organizations, direction, competence, opportunity and motivation. And again, I think for each of us, the, that kind of the driving to have the best organizations we can be. And coming to an end then, communications. Um, and we're all engineers, engineers and scientists, not always known for the best communications. Um, and being able to translate scientific messages into things that people will understand. So I think this piece about bridging the gap between complex engineering and the customer, and whoever that customer may be, uh, whether it's a member of the public or whether it's somebody you're selling to, we need to be able to translate our messages and to keep things simple and plain English. Um, and this isn't downplaying or downgrading our messages, it's making sure that they are accessible and relevant uh, to people. And last but not least, of course, I think it's always good to have a challenge in or a call to action in any presentation, and Ed delivered uh, on that, offering uh, a, 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 a fit for the future and making sure that Engineers Ireland is fit for a future, because we need to continue to evolve. Uh, and that is all organisations, no matter who they are, need to continue to change, evolve and stay relevant. Um, and to do that, we need to be engage, having strong engagement, communications, but ultimately adding value for our members. So there, there were my, my thoughts. Um, but the most important uh, part of my vote of thanks now is to propose that uh, the best thanks of Engineers Ireland be extended to the president for his address and I request his permission to have the address recorded in the transactions. And with that, I'm now going to call on John uh, for the second vote of thanks. So Vice President John Jordan. Thanks, Laura. President, it, it's an honor for me to get the opportunity to add my vote of thanks to Laura's. Your address on the symbiosis of engineering and entrepreneurship was excellent. From your very understandable description of entrepreneurship as akin to a farmer renting a field from a landlord uh, with no guarantee of a return, to your observation that the quality of your solution depends on your understanding of the problem, you have made what is a very complex topic accessible tonight. And I found your description of the arc of development you led at Dairy Master very interesting. From the mechanical through digitalization to optimization, and uh, finally to individualization. And each step differentiating yourself further from the competition and increasing barriers to entry. 
Uh, another point that resonated with me, and again with Laura, it seems, uh, regarding the value proposition, and uh, noting that you need to know what your customer values in order to serve them. And I, I agree also that we need to be mindful of this point here at Engineers Ireland. Engagement, communication, and adding value for our members. There's a lot more I took from the address, but we have questions to get to. Um, so finally, I agree with Mark Twain's sentiment. Explore, dream, discover. And I'm sure you'll be doing all three for many years into the future. I have pleasure in seconding the vote of thanks for an excellent and most interesting address. And I ask you to join in me, with me in expressing our appreciation of, of the President. <laughs> So I now call on President and Vice President back on stage for questions. Thank you. for a really wonderful thank, address. Thank you, Laura. Um, and we're, I think we'll all be thinking about it as we, uh, uh, for the rest of the evening and, and in the days to come. Well, we now have come to the question and answer session. Um, so I'm going to invite both guests here in Clyde Road uh, to be thinking about your questions um, and also said the guests online. So for those of you joining us in person, Hands up is, and we've got a microphone, and we've a, we've a couple of minutes. Um, and uh, as I said, for those of you uh, online, to, to email presidents at engineersireland.ie. And I am conscious that sometimes the people online feel a bit lost in in, in these things uh, and and distant. So we might go to a question uh, from online in the first instance. So maybe Anne Marie, I think you might have a question for us. Um, yeah, so our first question this evening is from Morris Buckley, um, past president of Engineers Ireland. Um, so Morris asks, if a young engineer is minded to start their own business, particularly outside engineering consultancy, do you have views on whether it's better to take the plunge early in one's career or to first build up experience and expertise by working in established companies involved in the area of interest? I think you could do either, is my view, right? So I've seen, you know, people start young and people start later in life, and both can be successful. Um, I think it's about their passion for it. It's uh, the solution that they implement that matters. I think the problem that they pick, because, um, uh, you know, time is the one thing that's limited. You know, I see a lot of companies, and, you know, if they don't get the traction in the product, that's, that's where they have the difficulties. So that's why I was talking about the urgent, pervasive and, and willingness to pay. And I think if you look at companies around there, be it early stage or late, if they can pick a problem that's that, they'd be successful. That's my view, you know. But like there's, there's successful entrepreneurs of all ages, you know, very, very young and, uh, and, uh, and, and older as well, you know. Thanks. For, so there's, t there's time for us all, Ed. Yeah, yeah, there's time for us all, yeah. Um, now, I did see a hand up in the audience there, sorry, in the middle there, and I will, the uh, microphone is coming to you, so, uh, yeah, a bit of a reach there. Um, this is probably the easiest question you answer tonight, but how did you hear about Engineers Ireland? Uh, I, I was in college. I heard about it in the first year in college, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Joel. Since it's here, Edmund, I'm going to take the opportunity. Um, Edmund, I suppose we listened yesterday, as it happened, we were both at, at, at an event in Tralee, mm -hmm. and we listened mm -hmm. to young engineers talking right. about new courses and new ways of looking at things. One of the things that struck me, I suppose, is somebody who's probably at least retirement age is somewhere, and it's a lot closer than it what used to be. Yeah. Um, is that, you know, when we started out as engineers, many of us, it was about giving us information um, about teaching us technical mm -hmm. theories and technical ways of doing things, how to design things, this and that. But I think one of the things that emerged from some of the discussions yesterday was that the pace of technology is moving so quickly mm -hmm. that anything that we learn today is probably obsolete within two to three years. And that it's now becoming far more important for engineers in, in the making, if you like, to develop an ability to identify, adapt, 
and Perfect. use new technologies. I just wondered if you wanted to make some comments on that, and, and I guess from an Engineers Ireland perspective. Yeah, yeah. so, uh, like, what so that like means. I suppose, you know, if you think about it, what, what does that mean in the context of what I said? There's new ingredients coming quicker at us than ever before, right? We should embrace them. We shouldn't be kind of worrying about, you know, the things of old that are there. It's how do we embrace them? How do we use them? Not to be afraid of them. And I suppose, you know, I, I describe a lot of a lot of engineering, it's a bit like Lego. It's uh, taking the right bits, putting them together in the right sequence to build something nice. The same analogy is building the cake, and that's what I think new technologies uh, is all about. Um, and the example I gave with the Moo Monitor, and we'll say the nanotech and all that, that's just a new ingredient. And you take AI, you, which is, let's say, the talk of today, um, that's just another new ingredient. And it's a case of what application do you apply that to, and does a customer value it? Uh, so I think it's I think it's to be to be excited and to be looking out for new things, uh, as opposed to maybe saying jeepers these are the tools in our toolbox of today. Um, there'll, there'll be new stuff tomorrow, and there'll be there'll be more stu new stuff again in ten years' time. That's what I think, Joe. Yeah, you know, okay. and I think software and and I suppose the different disciplines in engineering have merged. You know, so traditionally, you know, you might have been a civil engineer, a mechanical engineer, an electronic engineer, um, but if you just take take software, it transcends a lot of them. Um, so I think um, I think as engineers we need to be a bit more multidisciplinary, you know, and to understand all the different bits, you know. But essentially, it's just like different types of Lego, if you want to consider it like that, you know. Okay, thanks, um, Edmund. Um. And I'll go to go back to Anne Marie, um, and then I think I'm conscious we're between um, you and a few drinks in the, in the engineering club. So uh, maybe the last question from the online audience, Anne Marie. Um, yep, yeah, so um, this next question is from David Purcell, who's the chair of Engineers Ireland's Tomond region. Um, firstly, he says, congratulations on a very impressive presidential address. What's your favourite achievement in engineering to date? Ooh, that's a hard question. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's a good question. Um, I suppose the, the, there's lots of different things. I don't, I don't really have a favourite. I suppose you get a buzz out of doing the different things, and, you know, the next thing you do is... Um, it becomes the next challenge. Um, I suppose if you think about the job I'm doing at the moment, becoming president of Engineers Ireland, like I never thought that was going to happen back in whatever, you know. So like that's a, that's obviously a nice a nice achievement. Um, there's a number of you know there's a number of uh, I suppose technical ones as well, you know. Um, you know, like as as I say, there's a load of patents there. You could be talking about all of them, but I you know look, it's. It's probably things like the moon monitor, things like the digitalization, things like the individualization. Like you get a buzz out of doing all of them, but once you've once you've kicked that ball in the net, you know you're kind of wondering what's the next ball to kick, you know. So um, so yeah, so I, I probably don't have a favourite really, you know. You yeah. love all your children equally, as it were. That's it. That's <laughs> it. Now, yeah. Okay. Thanks, David. Okay. I, we we'll, might just, if, if you bear with us, one, I think there's two more questions and then we will definitely go to, uh, to, 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 oh, de into the bar. So, uh, gentlemen there and then down here. Um, hi, David. David. Um, I'm just thinking of the, the way agriculture in Ireland works and how we've fed ourselves and how yeah. it's not that many decades ago since a huge fraction of us were busy trying mm -hmm. to feed ourselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's been a huge transformation and yeah. you know, you've contributed substantially to it. I'm wondering if you look into the future and you consider all the environmental pressures there are mm. from you know, toxic emissions and uh, methane and all yeah. the rest of it, where is food production heading? Is it heading into the factory completely? It, it, Possibly, right? I think it depends, right? I think it's back to what does the customer value, right? So obviously climate change is a question. I don't think, you know, the indoor farming is necessarily the way to go. It is in some cases. Um, I suppose, look, the need for food, if you think of the hierarchy of needs and what do people need, you know? Um, you know, air, water, food, that type of stuff. You know, if you ask the youngsters, it'll be Wi-Fi and battery, you know? Um, you know? Um, look, we'll always need food. So there is a question of how is it going to be produced? And in fact, if you saw one of the pictures there, I put up, you know, there was one with Kofi Annan, and I had the pleasure of meeting him back about almost 10 years ago now. And um, it was interesting to see what was, what, what was his take on stuff. And he painted the challenge of actually the world feeding itself being one of the biggest issues he saw in the next 50 years, you know? And um, 
obviously there's the challenges of climate change and, 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 and so on as part of that, right? But this ability to feed the world was what he was marking out. And he talked about conflicts and he talked about things like that and he was involved in that. And he said, by and large, those tend to last maybe 10, 15 years, by and large, you know? And then they get resolved or patched up in some way. Um, but he saw that as one of the biggest challenges. So um, it will be a case of how do, how do we reduce our food that we eat, you know? And what will that food be? I can't... I can't tell you, you know. So, um, yeah. Thanks, yeah. Thanks David. Yeah. And then, we, Jerry. Jerry, there, yes, last yeah. question. And then definitely we'll, we'll, we'll finish it. Okay, I'll keep it short. Uh, Edmund, thanks very much. That was an outstanding presidential address. No, uh, thank uh, Jerry, you. Jerry Byrne is my name. I'm past president of Engineers Ireland. Engineers Ireland yeah. um, you used a word on your presentation, or simplicity, yeah. in the centre of it. Yeah. And uh, just when we reflect on simplicity, uh-huh. uh, it seems to me that the world is moving very much in the opposite direction to, to simplicity. Yeah. Uh, and as engineers, um, I suppose, I, I believe it's essential that we understand the processes yes. and yeah. the behavior of our systems. But increasingly, we're moving beyond the capability for a deep understanding of what's going on. Yeah. So I'm wondering, uh, I'm just trying, I, I think I, as engineers and indeed as educators of engineers, yeah. uh, you know, I, I to, suppose to, to educate an engineer uh, in a multidisciplinary, you mentioned multidisciplinary. So it's quite, mm-hmm. a, I think in engineering, we're facing very complex issue as to how best to engi- uh, educate the engineer, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but then the engineer exposed in society and really understanding the systems. Yeah. So yeah, just interested in your, your yeah, comments yeah. about it. So to me, simplicity means, you know, if I give it to Laura here uh, as a user, let's say, first of all, you know, does she, does she follow how to use it or does she have to read a 20 page manual to work out how, how to work it, right? Um, you know, so that's what simplicity to me is about. Does it, you know, um, you know, do I get it, let's say, right? Because if I don't get it or it's a complex thing to adopt, that's a problem. Now, if you go back to the engineering side and you say yeah systems are have got more complicated but actually they're all just building blocks now there's a question do i need to know how every little block and every little component and every little thing is made maybe i don't it's just like buying the lego blocks and if you look at software so if we go back say software you know um you know 25 years ago you had to write everything right you know um jeepers i quoted stuff where you had to add numbers you know and you were trying to do it as efficiently as you can and stuff like this nowadays you just say you know you, you grab libraries for stuff. So you say, jeepers, I want to do image recognition. Jeepers, there's a library out there. I'll just grab that, bring it in, call it, and the hard work is done for me. So that's that's a more complex Lego block than what was there before. And there's loads of people developing different Lego blocks. So it's about finding out what Lego blocks are out there that you can use and how do you put them together. Um, and that you don't maybe necessarily have to worry about the detail, let's call it, within the thing, unless there's something very intricate or you do have some you know technical issue that you do need to understand you know but i think having a a simple solution right is i i do think that's important you know well with that i think we'll call proceedings to an end and ed thank you very much and thanks for all of your answers to the the questions as well i'd say you might be pinned in the corner now with your (laughs) with a few more questions uh, as well but this is the end of the formal proceedings so thank you very much ed i'd like to thank the audience for the reception to my address and with pleasure, I, uh, you know, agree with the request that it be published in the transactions. Um, I would like to thank uh, everybody attending, whether in person or online. Uh, the meeting of Engineers Ireland is now concluded, and I would like to invite any of those uh, that are here in Clyde Road for a reception to Clafay Clyde. And good night, and thank you all very much.